Welcome to Podcast Bridging Voices, the podcast series of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Multinational Development Policy Dialogue in Brussels. With Podcast, we connect international experts and voices from the global south with policy and decision makers in Europe. Today we will discuss the current situation in Afghanistan, focusing our attention on the lessons learned from the 20 years of military engagement uh, in the country, which started in October 2001 after the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks and is coming to its end by September this year. My name is Janne Leino and I run our programs on foreign and security policy here in Brussels. Today I'm happy to present to you two distinguished guests. Firstly, I would like to introduce Dr. Elinor Tseino, since 2018, Dr. Zeno is the head of the Konrad Arnold Foundation's office in Kabul, which is currently transforming into a regional office covering Southwest Asia. Previous to joining the foundation, she used to work as a security consultant and as an analyst, focusing on the Middle East region. Hello, Dr. Zeno. Hello, thank you. Our second speaker today is Lieutenant General Rainer Glatz. General Glatz served as a professional soldier of the German Armed Forces for 44 years before retiring in 2013. During the last seven years of his military career, he served as deputy commander, acting commander, and commander of the Bundeswehr Joint Forces Operation Command. Thus, he was responsible for operational command of German military personnel deployed in 18 different missions abroad, one of them being Afghanistan. Hello, General Glatz. Hello, German. Uh, warm welcome to you both, and thank you for your time. To kickstart the discussion, I would like to ask you both a couple of energizers, so short questions. Please try to answer in a couple of words um, as we have the possibility to follow up in the discussion later. First question goes to you, Dr. Zaina. While we have heard about the worsening security situation in Afghanistan in recent months, we rarely hear about positive developments. Which positive developments in Afghanistan is giving you most hope for future development? Well, I would say one of the most positive developments is that um, the Afghans have never been so close to a political solution with the Taliban and that all sides, all main conflict parties in Afghanistan hold the opinion that there can only be a political solution to the conflict. And I think this is the main basis for, for success, successful peace, peace agreement. But of course, we have no guarantee of a peace agreement, and we don't know even if we will get peace after an agreement will be reached. So we are at a very vulnerable turning point in the country, and all sides have to seize this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Tsaino. And the second question uh, goes to you, uh, General Glatz. Looking from the European perspective, is Afghanistan now a safer place than it was in October 2001? You posed your question quite interestingly, because it's really related to the perspective from which you look at Afghanistan. If you look from a European perspective or from the perspective of the allies, uh, it's a safer place because we have denied terrorists a safe haven from which to plot attacks against us for more than 20 years. But you have to differentiate. In total, we have a worsening security situation. Last week, Tolo News reported about fighting in 80 of Afghanistan's roughly 400 districts in the country. The Taliban, so the peace talks are going on, are fighting for control one by one. To a certain degree, they seem to be successful, while Afghan security forces seem to be stretched to the breaking point. To sum it up, the size and the number of government defeats and territorial loss has only emboldened the Taliban and call into question Afghanistan's fate as the, as the United States and her allies near the end of their military involvement. So as to differentiate in some parts where there is still government control there is a safer place than 20 years ago. In the contested districts, with all the fighting, no. And what follows after the military leaves the country remains to be seen. Thank you, General Glass. That 
actually puts me already directly next to the, the question. You mentioned that the military is now leaving and you mentioned the unstable security threat or the security issue at the at the Afghanistan on the district levels. Um, you have previously publicly talked about the necessity to do an extensive evaluation um, on the military engagement in Afghanistan. In NATO or in Germany have not done this yet, but some countries like Norway have already uh, evaluated their involvement in Afghanistan. Uh, Norway has published a 238 pages evaluation report that states, among other things, and I quote, Norway should not assume responsibility for integrated missions, meaning state building, development and security on a large scale. Norway should instead be developed, uh, developing specialized expertise in areas where long term needs are identified. So in your point of view, General Glatz, do you agree with the findings from the Norwegian evaluation? What are your perspectives on this? Very honest, only to a certain extent, because the Norwegians never, ever had the responsibility for the whole of the integrated mission in Afghanistan. I have to add something uh, to your question. In effect, I always talked about evaluation as necessity, but I didn't put it only to the military because I'm totally convinced of the comprehensive approach. The United Nations engagement in Afghanistan was not a military intervention alone. It was the most complex United Nations mission the United Nations was ever involved in. 85 states out of those nearly 50 with a military contribution to ISAF, 15 big world organizations, and in between more than 1,700 NGOs. The mission had three lines of operations from my perspective. The first one was security. Here we talk about the military and police. The second one was good governance, which I would split up in security governance, security and control over state territory, political governance, legitimacy of political processes and adherence to the rule of law, administrative governance and socio-economic governance. And the third line of operation was reconstruction of and development. In this background, my assumption was and is that the tasks to be covered in an engagement like Afghanistan in this mission was split to somewhat of 20 to 25 percent on the military side and 75 to 80 percent on the civilian side. Therefore, I asked always for an evaluation in all these fields of the United Nations engagement in Afghanistan, especially because NATO agreed on the comprehensive approach during the NATO summit in Riga in 2006. Therefore, I plea for evaluation I know it's very, very difficult if you see the size and the, the dimension of this United Nations mission, but we wouldn't come to the right conclusions if we only would look at the military. Thank you, General Glatz. So I, I give one short question back to you. The Norwegian evaluation said that a comprehensive approach would not be ideal for Germany. If I understood you correctly, you would still be on a comprehensive approach in possible future missions. Yes, because I think that in a mission like Afghanistan, you can't win militarily because you have to have these three lines of operations I mentioned before. And if you look, look at those, uh, as, I'm, as I quoted, uh, security, good governance and reconstruction of development and development as a total package, then you have to have a comprehensive approach. Thank you, uh, General Glatz. I would then go back to you, Dr. Tseino. Um, you are based in Afghanistan, in, in, in Kabul, and uh, building up a South, uh, South East Asia, pro uh, sorry, and um, Central Asia program uh, for the foundation there. How do you see the, the cooperation between military and civilian personnel? We know that uh, the 
uh, resolute support mission from NATO is ending in September. How are the feelings uh, there regarding the, the mission? Um, how do the Afghan population perceive it and how do the diplomats based there perceive it, the situation at the moment? Thank you very much. That, that was many questions. But uh, maybe first some points on, on the uh, comprehensive approach. Uh, yes, of course, I also believe in the comprehensive approach because um, it can only work both together. But um, currently we see that, for example, Germany is quite, uh, the German administration is stating quite clearly that um, the civilian and political engagement in the country is independent from the military engagement. That's the current clear message that our government passes to the Afghan uh, government. And um, of course, we will, we want to stay in the country and we want to continue, but uh, currently we don't know what, what it means in terms of security and how we have to adopt our political or civilian engagement in the country. Your question on how it is perceived in the Afghan society, in the Afghan government, and the different Afghan political uh, groups and stakeholders. I think the opinion on the international troops presence in Afghanistan have been always mixed and diverse, as diverse as the Afghan society. What I have witnessed is that within the international community, there has been a very strong view that Afghans would approve the international troops as terms or as sort of um, a protection of the civilian population and of the Afghan state. But what I have seen is that uh, many Afghans see the troops as part of the problem because the Taliban have always said that they will continue their fight as long as there are international troops in the country. So I think many Afghans see the troops or have seen the troops as part of the problem in the country. Nowadays, I mean, we see a, a, an increasing nervousness and tension in the Afghan society, in the Afghan government, um, about what will happen in the upcoming weeks and upcoming months. Who will fill the military vacuum in the country? Will the Taliban be able to dictate the political conditions? Uh, what will happen to the civilian engagement? And also very practical questions of what will happen to the protection of the international airport in Kabul. So there are many questions are open and there's a lot of uncertainty. And the Afghan government, of course, they, uh, the, the government is in the weakest position because it is losing its, uh, it's losing NATO as its most important security partner. And uh, the United States has just recently um, stated very clearly that it will not provide any more military assistance in case that the Taliban would attack Kabul or the government for, for the upcoming weeks and months that they will show in what, in what direction the country and the situation will shift. We have no guarantee for success, and I can sense an increasing nervousness and tension in my Afghan networks in, 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 in Kabul and in the country. Thank you, Dr. Tseino. Um, I would also like to take up one aspect of uh, what you just mentioned. You said uh, troops are perceived um, as a part of the problem, and simultaneously you also mentioned that a comprehensive uh, approach combining civil and military engagement is necessary. So if you look at the, um, the last couple of months developments in Afghanistan at the moment, you see a pullback of the troops, of the international troops from Afghanistan. In your opinion, or, or, or according to your knowledge, has this influenced the, the civil engagement in Afghanistan? So where the troops have left, has the civil engagement stayed on a, on a similar basis where the NGOs being able to stay there or did they also have to move back with the troops? I must say, surprisingly, we haven't seen any large withdrawal of any international NGOs or the international uh, civilian engagement. Yes, there have been some embassies closing, the Australian embassy has closed and um, many international organizations are thinking uh, if they need some backup options. Of course, we have to think of different solutions, but I was quite surprised how clearly the main partners of the Afghan government have stated their solidarity and their continuity. And the main message was also from our side is that once the troops go out, once the military engagement goes down, the political and civilian engagement and commitment will become even more important. And um, I think that is at least a positive message that we can pass in the current moment. 
Thank you, Dr. Zainal. I would uh, then go to the next topic, uh, which is equally uh, interesting from Brussels' point of view, uh, namely uh, geopolitics um, around Afghanistan. So General Glatz, the, the next question um, is, is to you. Uh, I read through the NATO summit communique, and actually if you do a simple Google word search, um, it mentions China more often than Afghanistan. So I guess this is an illus this illustrates that the international focus is um, shifting from the war on terror, like it was called 20 years ago, uh, towards resiliency, supply chain management, or a systemic uh, rivalry, mostly with China. How do you see, what does this mean to Afghanistan, the change in, in geopolitics in the region? Before I come uh, to your question, let me just uh, mention one thing which... Uh, went through my head if I heard uh, Dr. Sino. The first thing is the comprehensive approach to the cooperation between the military and the civilian side can only be done if the military is in country. So it won't be done after the military is leaving the country to a certain extent. Second, the question uh, how the population in Afghanistan thinks. I think that differed all the time, and there have been, over time, opinion polls, not done by NATO, but by the Asia Foundation over the years. And there you could see when the troops were received positively, and you could see where troops have been seen not so positively. And if an engagement like Afghanistan is lasting 20 years, and uh, the troops engaged from outside the country are staying on one side as they were mandated by the United Nations to assist the interim government and later on the government of Afghanistan, then you are taking sides and you will have some people who won't like the military. So this is for me a very normal uh, development over time. Quite interesting is what you said, that people are getting nervous now that uh, the international military is going out, uh, how the power play is played out afterwards in Afghanistan. To your question about geopolitics, if uh, I look into the declaration by the NATO summit, you mentioned, Janne, then I see that there is a number withdrawing our troops does not mean ending our relationship with Afghanistan. We will now open a new chapter. We reaffirm our commitment to stand with Afghanistan, Afghan, Afghanistan, its people and its institutions. We will uphold the hard-won gains of the last 20 years, recalling our previous commitments. And then you find some things which have been talked about since years and which have been implemented some years ago. First thing, NATO will continue to provide training and financial support to the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. This probably could not be done uh, in-country, uh, there have to be looked for other options, for example, to invite people in the NATO states for training or things like that. Then there is mentioned the Afghan National Trust, Army Trust Fund, uh, to pay the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces, which is of most importance because if the payment would be drawn away with the withdrawing of the forces, then we would have a breakdown on the Afghan National Security Forces, from my perspective, relatively quickly. NATO will retain a senior civilian representative's office in Kabul to have diplomatic engagement continued. NATO is promising to Afghanistan that it will step up dialogue on Afghanistan with relevant international and regional partners, which I think is very important as well. NATO will continue to support the ongoing Afghan-owned and Afghan-lead peace process. There isn't a cut that there is nothing after the troops are withdrawing from Afghanistan. On the other hand, uh, as you mentioned, China and the systemic rivalry, uh, this is a process which has started in the United States 
with a focus on, on Asia and then the Pacific area, uh, not mentioning China at that time, uh, I think 20, 30 years ago, when some people called Weinberger and Eagleburger talked for the first time of the importance of the Asian Pacific area in relation to Europe, for example. So this focus to Asia or the pivot to Asia as President Obama, it mentioned for the first time was long foreseen. So people which now seem to be astonished uh, didn't follow from my perspective the politi political discussions for a long time. Resiliency is in fact a very new catchword because we see the threats in the cyber space and uh, we see all threats related uh, to so-called hybrid warfare. And therefore resiliency is a catchword which uh, was uh, put up, I think, four years ago, somewhat around this time. And now it's going into NATO strategy and therefore it was, was mentioned in the declaration. So all of that really was long to be foreseen. I'm not astonished about it. How it will touch on Afghanistan, I'm not really sure because the Chinese involvement in Afghanistan, I have seen even when I was an active soldier uh, with the first uh, contracts uh, to be done on the copper mines in northern, northern Afghanistan. And there might be interest uh, of, of Chinese uh, side in a calm Afghanistan to a certain extent because some of the Silk Road projects run through Balochistan on the Pakistan side. Uh, they certainly want not to be disturbed. Thank you, General Glatz. I think this puts us also to the other countries in the region. We also mentioned the airport in uh, in Kabul, which bears the name of uh, the late president of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai. I have a quote from him here, which was published in a recent article, which says that according to President Karzai, both the Afghan Republic and the Taliban are victims of external forces. That is why we are suffering. So with this uh, remark in, in the article, he did not only mean US or NATO troops at the currently stating in, uh, stated in the country, but external forces around Afghanistan, which are influencing political process within that country. He names uh, Pakistan, for example, uh, but also uh, the disputes between Pakistan, India, as well as the influence of Iran. Uh, Dr. Zaino, how much influence do these powers have on the on the peace, peace process there? And uh, how much influence do these external actors have both on the Afghan government and towards the Taliban? Well, it, it really depends. But uh, generally, I would say that probably we will witness a regionalization of the security affairs in Afghanistan in, uh, and in the neighborhood. And I also think once the troops are out, once the United States withdraw, and uh, the Americans will lose their political interest in the country and leave it to the regional countries. And we have all already seen it during um, the Doha peace process and also in the failed Istanbul initiative that the United States have encouraged the regional, regional countries and the United Nations to take over more responsibility. But the way how much influence each regional country has in the country, in Afghanistan depends and uh, varies across the different countries, but all of them have stakes in the country and um, maintain their own rather personal relations to different power brokers, different groups and stakeholders. And what we have seen in the last years is that all regional countries have established relationships or contacts to the Taliban side. and. It was only India that had always said they won't maintain any context to the Taliban side, but recently they said they all, all also um, established context to the Taliban. And this is what we are seeing now. Among all neighbor countries, of course, Pakistan plays a very crucial role in the future of the peace process and in the future of the country and has a large sway of influence over the developments. But um, sometimes I would say that Pakistan's um, strength of influence, for example, over the Taliban is a little bit overrated from the Afghan perspectives and from the Afghan government. 
But of course, their constructive role in peace will be, will be crucial. Currently, I must say, there's an increasing narrative in Kabul and in the networks that uh, they fear that Afghanistan will be handed over to Pakistan once the troops are out. So it is similar to the narrative we have seen um, in 2003 in Iraq when there was a narrative Iraq will be handed over to Iran. So here we see a similar security vacuum that is feared by, by the Afghan people. And uh, compared to the other countries, I find quite remarkable, for example, India. India has kept a very low profile role in Afghanistan, never sent troops to Afghanistan, but it is one of the most important regional development partners of the Afghan government. It maintains four diplomatic missions and um, it is the largest development partner. It, it, its development aid is even exceeding the Chinese development aid. So this I find quite remarkable, but in the moment I see India is not taking over any active role and India is more or less seen as the uh, strategic loser of any power sharing agreement with the Taliban side. Then one player, which is Iran, is seen quite ambivalent. Iran has influence in Afghanistan, and it depends a little bit on the different stakeholders and power brokers. Primarily, Iran has, of course, influence in the Shiite Hazara groups and uh, in Western Afghanistan, in the province of Herat. There's a lot of mistrust against Iran's role in the future. But I think Iran has to balance its security interests. And Iran has established working relations where, well, Iranians say they have only established contacts with the Taliban side because they are quite pragmatic and they know they have to establish ties with the Taliban in order to influence any future development. What I find interesting, because our office in Kabul, we maintain, of course, all kinds of channels of communication, of, of dialogue and uh, contacts with different stakeholders. And whenever I had the chance of talking to Iranian officials, um, they clearly say that they want good relationships also with the Taliban government, but at the same time, they have always stated that they support the current constitution, well, I would say liberal constitution of the Afghan Republic, and they don't even see the Iranian model of Islamic Republic. They don't see it as a model for Afghanistan. This is something I find quite remarkable because, of course, Iran fears that a new Taliban regime, an Islamic Republic run by a Taliban-ruled government will be in competition to the Iranian neighbor. Last but not least, China. China is quite invisible in the country. I find also, I find that also quite remarkable. And China has avoided any visible leadership role in the country or any footprint in Afghanistan and was more or less free riding and relying on NATO to provide for security in Afghanistan. For the future, I think possibly China might have to take over some more responsibility, but the um, primary interests of China are driven by economic considerations and of course their Belt and Road Initiative and um, their interest in regional trade routes, energy routes, and resources. And to sum up, I would say that we will witness a regionalization of the security affairs in Afghanistan, and we hope that it will not result in a new great game among the different regional players. Janak, let's looking from purely a military uh, role, as you have experience uh, of this in, in Afghanistan, how do you see this uh, vacuum, security vacuum? Who will fund the troops of Afghanistan in the future? Where do the weapons come from? Do you have any idea of this? It's quite an interesting question because I mentioned the NATO summit declaration before. And uh, within this, uh, you can read that uh, NATO will give financial support to the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces, including through the Afghan National Army Trust Fund. And that is exactly what has been done before. In effect, on this way, the Afghan security forces have been financed. And this uh, promise to further finance the Afghan National Security Forces at a certain stage of time, I, I can't uh, recall now exactly the year, was related to the civilian support, which has been promised through all the donor conferences since Tokyo. And there, 
always was written down till 2024. So for me, it's a big question mark whether this financial support will exceed the year uh, 2024. I'm not really sure whether it will be possible to convince all the governments which have been paying in the National Army Trust Fund in Afghanistan uh, to further support money to this trust fund uh, exceeding 2024. So then it will be a big question who is getting in. Uh, if you are looking at the countries around, armament is there everywhere where you are looking. Uh, whether some of them really will then provide the weaponry, I'm not really sure. Because if uh, Pakistan would do it, it would come in conflict immediately with India, uh, which both of them certainly don't want uh, to be because there are conflicts around enough. China, I couldn't imagine. Maybe small arms weaponry. Uh, as Dr. Sino said before, uh, from my perspective, it's the economic interest in the country in connection with the projects on the Pakistani and uh, uh, side concerning the Belt and Road Initiative, which, which have to be safe. Iran, I wouldn't see that. But what we can see, and Dr. Sino will probably uh, support my view on that, is that in northern Afghanistan, the former Northern Alliance power brokers are already rearming as he did in, in similar situations in the past, uh, again and again and again. They will get weapons. I'm not really sure whether it will come from the regional partners, because there is too many uh, source of conflict between those which could be steered by supporting Afghanistan in such a way. Thank you, uh, General Glatzen and Dr. Zainal. Uh, you both mentioned power brokers. Um, I would like to take I would like to take this uh, opportunity and go towards the next topic, which is uh, to think about the future development um, of Afghanistan and Europe's response to that. I took from our previous questions the date. 2024 uh, from General Glatz already as the next uh, date when we have to see where does this financial support for the civilian actors uh, come from. Um, there's an interesting study as well published by the Brookings Institution. Um, and this study paints four possible scenarios for the development of the Afghan society. So in scenario number one, mostly the existing order would be uh, preserved. You, Dr. Zayn also mentioned the support for the current constitution and uh, most of the gained liberties would be preserved. In the scenario number two, uh, Brookings Institution says that there might be a Taliban power broker deal, which means that the Taliban would go past the current government and make a deal to divide the country uh, and its institutions. In scenario number three, pretty much the same, the Taliban would have bigger victories in the near future, then have a negotiation power from strength, take a bigger influence uh, in the Afghan government. And the, the last and the, the most worrying uh, scenario would be that this uh, would escalate into a civil war and fragmentation of the country into different warlords or in different fractions. So my question to both of you uh, from these four different scenarios, uh, what do you think is uh, currently seen as the most likely one? We would start with Dr. Zeyna from, from the experience on the ground. Thank you. Well, I would say that um, in the moment, it is still too early to say which direction the country will take and which scenario is um, the most likely. Currently, I would say that all, all four scenarios are equally realistic and um, it, um, it will show, we will see it in an upcoming time in which direction the country will turn. But um, I can confirm also General Glatz's remark that yes, we see um, a rearming of the militias, especially in the northern, uh, in the northern parts of Afghanistan of different power brokers, and that is worrying. And, what I would see maybe as the most um, likely scenarios, 
I would say that um, I wouldn't think, or we, we are not concerned of the Taliban taking over militarily the, the whole country and taking over militarily and politically, because they will, this kind of military attack will be heavily contested. And it's one question to take over a city for a couple of days, but keeping the city for, for the future and establishing a political government, that's a different question. And also the Taliban know they want international recognition and the Taliban leadership knows that if they take over militarily, they will never gain the international recognition and they will not get access to international money. So we are less afraid of, of this kind of scenario Actually, I th would say that we are much more concerned about more of a civil civil war scenario that um, different groups, armed groups, and that's not only the Taliban, but there are many armed groups, that different armed groups will try to fill the security vacuum and fight each other and that we, re we will reach a new stalemate, but at a ha more higher level of violence. I think this is one scenario that we really fear. The positive scenario would, of course, would be to reach some kind of a power broker deal. You mentioned a rapid Taliban power brokers deal. Yes, I think this was a little bit the, the um, tendency that we could witness in the last months. Um, I think the United States in the Doha peace process have more or less preferred some kind of a pragmatic and rather quick power broker deal with the Taliban have no longer supported some kind of a conditions-based approach. So this could be also a likely scenario, but I don't think that we will have these extreme scenarios that the Taliban take over the whole country or that the existing order will be preserved and not contested. So I think these two scenarios would be less likely. Thank you, Dr. Tsena. Uh, General Glatz? In most points, I agree to what Dr. Sino said, but um, I have a question mark in my mind for scenario number one. The existing order is preserved. This will be very, very difficult because, uh, as I said before, all the success of the Taliban on the battlefield and uh, the losses of territory from the perspective of uh, the Afghan government, from my perspective, have emboldened the Taliban. What they didn't want and what they didn't accept was this Afghan government, which we have now. This one was, was one of the biggest problems uh, concerning uh, the peace talks in Doha. We all remember how long it took until for the first time there was spoken from the Taliban side to an Afghan delegation from Kabul, which was not presenting in total the Afghan government. The existing order to be preserved for me is uh, very, very doubtful. The second scenario, a rapid Taliban bro power broker deal might be in the interest of most of those concerned, even in Doha. The question is who will be the power brokers to deal with Will it be the Afghan government? Will it be, for example, uh, the Northern Alliance? Will it be militia commanders uh, in the western part of Afghanistan, which are looking very nervously what's going on as well? So my fear, so I'm not a pessimist, is that to a certain extent, if there will be not an agreement in reach in Doha in a certain amount of time, that alongside a slippery slope, not uh, by intent, we could get into a civil war. Thank you, General. From both of your answers, I recognized maybe two different trends here. So one trend is that the Taliban at the moment is emboldened through military successes and gaining, um, gaining area on, on the ground in Afghanistan. But the second aspect is also uh, a certain tamedness or that the Taliban will be tamed through 
continuous civil uh, engagement. We mentioned funding, for example. So a lot of the hospitals, a lot of the schools are done by civic funding currently, which is still flowing. Uh, General Glatz mentioned until 2024 uh, currently. So keeping these two trends in, in mind, so Taliban successes militarily, but also on the other hand, uh, keeping the country stable, by keeping the finances, the aid flowing into the country, what do you? How do you see uh, the European Union or NATO uh, as an actor in future uh, development of Afghanistan? And what could they do in order to make the scenario as good as possible for the people on the ground? I would also go with Dr. Zaino first on this. Well, now that uh, that the troops are leaving, I would say that we don't have any much more the military card to play. But um, I also doubt that we had this card in, uh, card in the last years. So I think the future role of the European Union and the international community would be to be a little bit more honest about Afghan ownership. So we, I think we have to believe or have more confidence in the Afghan conflict parties that they are responsible for the future of the country and that it's only them who can find peace and make peace. And my core message to our Afghan partners has always been that they should not wait for, for an external savior because there won't be any external savior. Of course, we can show our solidarity. And one of the main challenges I see for the upcoming years is that we have to shift our international assistance away from a complete aid-based approach and have a stronger focus on, for example, on private investments, on economic and trade relationships, on helping Afghanistan to connect and integrate in the regional trade and uh, trade order, or easing visa regulations for Afghan business people, educational exchange, etc. So there, it's lots of things we can do. And another point would also be exerting maybe diplomatic pressure on some players, for example, on Pakistan to behave more constructively in the peace process. But I think this kind of diplomatic means will be not very strong. So I think for the future, we should, be, we should not raise too high expectations for the Afghans, expectations that we cannot meet in the end. I think this is very important. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Zaino. I, 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 I took from this the ownership of the, of the Afghans and put the focus on, on private investments and opening possibilities for Afghanistan or Afghan actors to develop their own country while keeping the geopolitical pressure diplomatically uh, on the neighboring countries to have a constructive role in this. Uh, General Glatz, um, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. I think the constructive role of the neighboring countries is really should be really a main priority. On, on the second side, as Dr. Sino said, uh, investment in Afghanistan is a very, very tricky issue from my perspective. I had uh, the opportunity to accompany the Afghan Minister of Mining when he was traveling Europe some years ago. And he had a plea for investment in Afghanistan. And he was not only in, in Berlin, he was traveling uh, the EU as a whole. And everywhere where he talked about investments, he got interest. But in the end, people said, as long as there is no security in your country, we won't go in with investment because this would be high risk investment uh, in things we have to build up from the, from the scratch on. And therefore, there was no interest to go in. So we have to convince in the way, as, as Dr. Sino said, the Afghans that they have to get their act together because as long as there is no security within the country, it would be very, very difficult to get investment in. Uh, the second thing from my perspective is uh, we have promised the Afghans a lot. When I was leaving Afghanistan in 2013, before I went to retirement, my last trip to Kabul, I had a lot of talks on the political side and on the military side. And always 
there was one question in the end. We had so many promises from you, the Western people, even in the past, after the Soviet Union left Afghanistan. Will you stay to us and stay together with us in future now, or will we lose your promised support again? This was a heart-burning question I heard many, many, many times. And from this perspective, I would say we have to stay to our obligations. We laid on the table during all the donor conferences on one side. We have to support uh, in those fields uh, we promised to support uh, the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces uh, till 2024 to the minimum. And if we want to stabilize the country, we have uh, probably to keep that for a longer time. Then I really um, agree to Dr. Sino. I can't see the Taliban controlling all of the country, but it's very much related to the capability of the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces, what really happens after the troops left. Playing the military card, as Dr. Sino said, was never foreseen to a certain extent after 2014 when ISAF left Afghanistan. What was done with RSM was a stabilization of uh, the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces, not less, but even not more than that. They have to be stabilized from my perspective on a, on a longer term if they want to keep uh, the balance with the Taliban to a certain extent. I took here also uh, two things. First, uh, you put it very straightforward, help to get the Afghanistan people and uh, the actors there to get their act together and keep up the both military and uh, civilian uh, promises that have been made. Uh, in the past. Uh, you mentioned, for example, financing the Afghanistan uh, army so that they can pay the wages for the soldiers who are currently uh, deployed. Uh, I think Dr. Zaino mentioned earlier as well the airport. Um, the NATO communique says that the airport security will be guaranteed by, by NATO also in the future or by through NATO channels um, also in the future. So um, even though military-wise the mission will end in September latest uh, this year, um, there will be still an input uh, from also the military side for Afghanistan security um, after this. Uh, with these uh, comments, I think we could continue the discussion for a longer period of time. Um, I would like to thank uh, both of our guests, Dr. Zaino and uh, General Glatz, uh, for joining us today for this discussion. Uh, thank you, listeners, for uh, joining in today. Thank you very much and goodbye. With podcasts, we connect international experts and voices from the global south with policy and decision makers in Europe. We encourage and facilitate open dialogue on current global issues. At CUS MDPD, we design and implement multi-stakeholder dialogues, focusing on the nexus of democracy and governance, peace and security, and climate and energy. Join our LinkedIn community, tag us in your tweets, and add us on Facebook. You can listen to the full episodes of podcasts on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Visit our website for our latest publications.